Hello and welcome everyone to our eighth annual Flash Fiction Night here at the Hoover Public Library. It's my privilege tonight to introduce each of our talented performers who will be sharing with you their stories. I use the word story in the broadest sense because tonight you will have the pleasure of hearing poetry, excerpts from novels, and a selection of personal essays. Despite the differences in form or whether or not these pieces stem from fact or fancy, each is a story in that they bespeak the heart, mind, and spirit of their author. Our authors tonight are regular attendees of Wright Club, which the Hoover Public Library facilitates 11 months of the year. Wright Club is a monthly support group for writers of all stripes. Be you poet, novelist, playwright, memoirist, all are welcome. And what you are welcome to is an environment which fosters creativity among like-minded individuals. We meet one Saturday a month at this library to share from our current endeavors and to receive feedback from our peers in an open, friendly forum. Future dates for these meetings can be found on the handouts in the lobby, as well as a sign-up sheet for emails about all of our future meetings, which includes special events such as a reading from Birmingham-based poet Ashley M. Jones on June 24th and a reading from novelist Bryn Chancellor on September 30th. To find out about all this and more, all you have to do is legibly put down your email, and I can't stress legibly enough. Finally, allow me to say that I am so glad that you, all of you could join us this evening in support of not only the friend or family member who managed to drag you out of the comfort of your home to come and attend this event, but also by proxy your support of the arts, which I believe may be the greatest invention and unifying force the history of humanity has to offer. As Martin Amos writes, only in, art will the lot, <clears throat> only in art will the lion lie down with the lamb and the rose grow without form, thorn. Excuse me. Before I introduce our first author, may I encourage all of you to welcome each of our readers with a round of polite applause, followed by a rousing round of applause after each finishes their performance. And also, may y'all please silence your cell phones so that no one gets thrown off their groove while they're reading. Um, but without any further ado, allow me to welcome to the stage our first reader of the night, Shonda Arman. He is a library staff member in the adult fiction department where he can regularly be found pretending to know more than he actually does. He regularly publishes fiction, reviews, and general complaining on his blog, A Walk on the Woolly Side, which has received over 100 views from Poland and Ireland combined. Please welcome to the stage, Sean. Thank you. Also on my blog, for the past two years, I've participated in what I refer to as the Isaac Asimov Challenge, which is to publish a new short story on the blog every day for an entire week. It's a great writing exercise. If anybody wants to join me this year, I do it the second week of September. I've gotten some bizarre things out of it, including a song, a one-act play, a story about staking a vampire, like a Bob Newhart monologue. And something a bit more true to form is my story tonight, Sacrificing the Lamb, which is a fable without a moral. The sun rose over the eastern hill, casting gentle rays on the meadow below. And as far as anyone cared to look, a banquet of wild rye and goose grass beckoned the large flock of sheep who grazed with little care beyond satisfying their stomach's demands. It was only the smallest lamb who noticed that high above them, a stone's throw and a half away, there was a fox who had taken more than a passing interest in her flock. And after some thought, she broke away from the herd and climbed the hill to where he lay. The fox eyed her curiously as she bounded well into the scope of his prospective lunge. She greeted him kindly. Good day to you, sir. Indeed, little one. It is a good day. I always find mornings to be most agreeable. Well, as luck would have it, I find myself in agreement with you. The two creatures laughed together, and the lamb found a comfortable patch of greenery in which to sit. Might I be so audacious as to ask you a question? Audacious? The fox stretched, shaking off the dewdrops from his red coat. Yes, you might very well be. Seeing as how you are a fox, 
Is it fair to assume that your intention is to make a meal out of one member of my family? That would be a safe assumption. It is in keeping with the fox's nature. Well, sir, you have so many sheep to choose from in size, health, and number of seasons. How does a fox's nature select? The fox's nature selects the same way the nature of all living things selects. The greatest amount of reward for the least amount of effort. I see, said the lamb, losing herself in thought. Perhaps out of curiosity, the fox made no motion towards the vulnerable lamb, opting instead to wait for whatever droplet of reflection her innocent mind constructed. Is that wise? Wise? It's effective. How should wisdom factor into it? Foxes are known for their cleverness. What is cleverness if not wisdom as tactic? You know, I'm asking myself why you approached me. Being as small as you are, you were already easy prey, and now you've made my task all the simpler. The lamb smiled. And despite the minimal amount of effort it would take, you haven't eaten me. All right, then. I'm intrigued. Why haven't I eaten you? If you can give me a satisfactory answer, then I will let you go, and I will also leave your flock alone. What a delightful challenge. The lamb sprang to her feet and scampered up next to the fox, closer than any lamb had ever dared of their own volition. She sat down next to him and gazed out over the landscape. It's beautiful, isn't it? Truly, I'll not deny it. Did you know that where you and I are sitting so peacefully is, in fact, a battleground? The fox shook his head. I'm not familiar with the history of these hills. Oh, I don't mean a battleground of the past. I mean the one happening right now. This battle of wits between us? Not at all. The lamb sniffed a lavender blossom between them. The jaws of a predator are gruesome, but they pale in comparison to the murderous aggression of the grass. As far as you can see, there are seedlings strangling each other for territory. These peaceful hills are absolute carnage that you and I see as serene because we only see a single moment in the eons of chaos. That is both fascinating and insightful, but how does it answer the question at hand? Because the grass doesn't have a choice the way animals do. The ability to choose surely must indicate that something beyond self-interest motivates one such as yourself. I agree with you, little one, but all you're doing is supporting the claim that there is an answer, not what that answer may be. Well, for that, I should tell you a story. There was a vain centipede who was so proud of its magnificent length that it would walk all over the land, drawing attention to itself, making sure everyone saw the immaculate way its many, many legs functioned in unison. Yes, I'm familiar with this story. Somebody asks the centipede how it manages to get all of its legs to walk in harmony. Mm -hmm. And the centipede, who had strode so gracefully before without a thought, suddenly thought about it. And as such, it was unable to walk the way that it had ever again. What does that story tell you? That some questions can be harmful. Maybe. But maybe questions only serve to awaken us. Maybe we sleepwalk through our lives and strangle each other for our own self-interests until we start asking ourselves why. You see, there's an ending to this story that very few know. That centipede loved walking so much that being robbed of the experience that had brought it so much joy drove it to keep trying and failing and trying. No, it was never able to walk the way it had before, just like you can never unask a question, but the centipede was able to walk in a new way, learned from pain and effort, and in the end, it could do more than just walk. The centipede could dance. In the distance, the lamb's flock bleated, but the fox could barely hear it over the rustle of the grass waving in the breeze. Why, you cunning little mutton scrap. How could I possibly eat you now? It would make me too sad. Was that your plan all along? I had no plan, no answer. I only thought if I were to die today, 
I would make it mean something and be remembered. The fox stretched back out in the grass. You know, little one, today truly is a good day. The little lamb curled up next to him, and together they fell asleep. Well, it looks like my quote was more fitting than I imagined. Isn't it great when things work out? Well, our next uh, presenter tonight is Jason Head. Jason Head is a computer programmer by trade and classic film enthusiast. His proposed novel is From a Small Town. It is based on his own experiences growing up in the rural south. These are the opening pages of that novel. Let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story. My name is Robert Jackson Hood. I was named for two Civil War generals, Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson, though nobody ever knew that when I went through high school being addressed as Rob. I grew up on a sand mountain village called Albertville, Alabama. There wasn't much there when I was a kid. Poultry farmers and used car lots. You either raised chickens or you sold cars, new and many different shades of used. There were other jobs, but very few glamorous ones. If you worked at a bank, you were considered high society because that meant you could join the local country club and your children wouldn't have to swim at the pool by the high school with the black kids. Whenever I went to school and saw the white kids pick on each other while the black kids never fought each other, I realized the absurdity of such a premise. Women would frequently set up one room in their house as a beauty shop and develop a loyal clientele of customers. One such woman lived up the street from us, but she had her own shop in her backyard. There were a couple of lawyers in town, clothing store owners, and a drugstore or two. There was one hardware store that sold everything from needles to plows and one movie house that was referred to in our home as the picture show. Albertville was a dry town in a dry county, so you had to go to Etowah County for beer and hard liquor. I don't recall sipping a glass of wine until after I'd finished school at the University of Alabama. But if you lived in Albertville, you either had a little bit of money or you had none at all. You either had a little bit of luck or you were totally devoid of it. My family was totally devoid of it. Luck and money as well. The first hood came to Atlanta, to Albertville during Reconstruction. He came from Conyers, Georgia, a little town just east of Atlanta. In the 1960s, Georgia Tech fielded a defensive back named Tony Hood from Conyers, and we were always curious as to whether or not he was related to us somehow. When I lived in Atlanta one winter in the mid-80s, I went into a realtor's office in Conyers. His name was Reggie Hood. I told him who I was and timidly asked him if perhaps we weren't related to one another somewhere along the line. I was told that the first Hood came to Georgia from North Carolina in the 1830s and that he had 18 sons. His descendants are spread all over the South, if not the entire country today. My great-great-grandfather, Harmon Hood, was like most of the post-war era, outrunning carpetbaggers, Sherman, and whatever semblance of the law remained during that time. He acquired a piece of land on Sand Mountain, rounded up a couple of mules, a woman willing to become his wife, and began plowing as he had done in Georgia. Not much is known about him. He died as quietly as he lived in his sleep in 1891. His son, Oscar, is where my story really begins. The only vestige of Oscar Hood that remains on this earth is a faded black and white photograph that my father's brother gave me. It shows a broken down old man sitting in a rocking chair on the front porch of an ancient wooden house he evidently lived in during his later years. 
The portion of the house in the photograph is unpainted. Oscar's gnarled hands are folded in his lap, left on right. He's clad in overalls and high top shoes that were worn out and doesn't appear to be wearing socks. Gray headed and unsmiling, his face shows every inch of the miles he plowed in his youth behind a mule. Atop his head is a ragged slouch hat faded from the sun and one wonders how he ever had enough energy to even rise out of that chair. In his youth, Oscar had something of a mind for business, at least agricultural prosperity anyway. It is assumed in the litany of my family's history that he acquired his business acumen from the long hours spent guiding a plow behind those mules that Harmon hitched him to every spring when a new crop had to be planted. Such burdensome labor would sooner or later lead almost any enter enterprising young fellow to think of a better way to make money. He knew that the secret to making a man's fortune in an agrarian society was land, land, and more land. Each time he planted and made any profit at all, he set about to buy more of it. He took the 20 acres that Harmon bequeathed him and over the years parlayed it into 300. The Hoods were cotton farmers, as were almost anyone else on Sand Mountain who made their living from the soil. Cotton had been king for 300 years in the South, and it would be for another 100 unless war erupted, or so it was thought. Each autumn, kids got new shoes, bank accounts were replenished, and if you were extremely profitable, your house acquired some modernity that made you the talk of the town. Usually, that was indoor plumbing. A family's wealth was measured in part by whether or not there was an outhouse behind the home you lived in. My father didn't see a porcelain toilet anywhere but school until he was 18 years old. Oscar knew that land needed hands to tend it. His wife, Maud Coates, became quite prolific at burying those hands. In all, she delivered 10 hungry, bawling hoods, the sixth being my grandfather, Jim, the last killing her before it too perished from the singular act of being delivered out of a worn out 40 year old body in 1930. The dead child was born on a blistering August day, almost at high noon between two rows of cotton. He was laid to rest in an unmarked grave that afternoon and his mother two days later. At some point in time, shortly thereafter, Oscar took in a boarder one of the thousands of displaced Depression-era hobos who roamed the countryside picking up whatever odd jobs they could find before a local municipal ran them off for vagrancy. Taking in that border was the single biggest mistake Oscar made in his entire life. Had his wife not died, it would never have happened. His name was Coltrane Winters. My great-grandfather thought he would pick up the slack in the field left by the death of his wife. When I was a child, my father's family was quite fond of comparing Winters with anyone whom they considered shiftless, lazy, mean, womanizing, or merely drunk. Such persons were said to be as sorry as Coltrane Winters. I remember asking my father once as a seven-year-old at the supper table, immediately after he had applied the phrase to his boss, just how sorry is Coltrane Winters, Dad? For my trouble, I got a look that would melt steel, the back of his hand across my face, and a shut up meat muttered between bites of cornbread and peas. My mother would later tell me that Coltrane Winters had been responsible for the one incident that kept my family poor for two generations. Thank you. And that just goes to show you that um, not only um, are stories about animals, and fables, and rhyme, but family history can have the power of fables. So thank you for sharing that. Um, <clears throat> our next presenter is Phil Fishman. He is a converted Southerner from Indiana. He graduated from IU with a major in chemistry. 
Phil was in R Phil was in ROTC and came south after graduating in 1961 to serve two years at Fort McClellan. He met Sarah, his wife to be, in late 62 and married her in 63, shortly before he left the service. Most of his career was in chemical sales and marketing, but he later became a consultant and then a teacher. Finally, in retirement, he started to write. Mainly political commentary, including a lot of parody on Facebook. Phil has self-published three books, including his latest, which he will read from. Phil has a few copies with him in the event that anyone is interested in purchasing one after the program. So please welcome to the stage, Phil. Thank you, Anthony. <clears throat> Thank you all. Thank you all for, for attending. Uh, as Anthony says, this is a chapter from, from my uh, novel. And the title of the chapter is Ransom. Yeffie, what do you want us to do with him? Finish him off pronto or slowly? No, Pancho, replied El Diablo, not yet. I want to send his senora a ransom note. Aha, Yeffie, how much? $10,000, El Diablo answered. So little? I want her to be able to afford it so that she will come to us. You have this gringo, gringo's driver's license. Send her a message that we have her husband and that if she wants to see him alive, she will say nothing to the authorities and bring the money to us. El Diablo was illiterate, but not stupid. His Lieutenant Pancho was born to an educated family and had learned English as a child. See, si, Yeffi, I will take care of it. Muy bien, Pancho. The uh, <clears throat> message is as follows. September 21st, 2043. Dear Senora Brockton, as you have probably learned by now, we are holding your husband. He has not been harmed and will not be so long as you follow our instructions to the letter. Do not be tempted to contact the authorities if you wish to ever see your husband alive again. We have paid informers throughout the state of Arizona and will know if you even try. You are to bring $10,000 in unmarked $100 bills. The Arizona Border Patrol, as was all the Border Patrols until secession, an arm of the Federal Homeland Security Agency. There were 4,200 agents assigned to Arizona, and when secession occurred, Arizona offered them the choice of leaving federal service and joining the newly formed Border Patrol reporting to the state are taking their chances on obtaining employment in some other capacity with the federal government. Many were natives of Arizona, but even more coming from other states had made their homes in Arizona and did not want to uproot their households. There was also the consideration that they might not have jobs if they left the state. With inflation and budgetary cutbacks throughout the federal government, civil service was highly uncertain. Over 3,000 of them accepted the offer, despite the fact that salaries had to be reduced substantially to keep them in line with state troopers' salaries. Sergeant Brett Brockton had been an Arizona Border Patrol agent for eight years after four years as a Tucson City policeman. He had a degree in criminology from the University of Arizona where he had met his wife, who was in pre-law. Brett had aspired to the FBI, but there were no openings at the time of his graduation, so he joined the Tucson police force. He and Lenore were married shortly thereafter, and then when Lenore became pregnant, she dropped out of school with the thought of caring for her infant until the child was of school age. Unfortunately, she had a miscarriage in her eighth month, and Lenore, rather than going back to school, took a job as a paralegal to supplement their income. During the short time Brett was a cop, he had had several run-ins with drug gangs and distinguished himself as a courageous and selfless cop. He was on the fast track for promotion, but when the opening for Border Patrol came up, Brett didn't hesitate to apply. 
And it wasn't only the difference in salary and benefits that made the decision easy. It was the fact that he would be fighting the real war against drugs, not the skirmishes he had been involved in as a policeman. There were 51 applicants for the single position and the screening was intense. There were, of course, the interviews and background checks, but there were also psychological and lie detector testing and then physical and endurance testing. The entire process took seven days, and by the last day, the field had been winnowed down to three candidates. The other two were excellent candidates, but did not have the on-the-job experience Brett had. He continued to distinguish, distinguish himself as a border patrolman, and in short order had been promoted to the rank of sergeant. Now he was in the hands of his sworn enemy after being captured in a gunfight on the border about 20 miles east of the Lukeville border crossing station four days earlier. Brett had not gone down easily. His right knee had been shattered by a high-caliber <clears throat> high bullet, but the clincher was a bullet wound to his right temple that knocked him out. The bullet had entered just above his brow and exited at the top of his ear. A centimeter or so further in, and Brett would have joined his two dead colleagues. His team of three had been overtaken by 12 drug runners, and when the battle was over, Brett and four bad guys were the only survivors. El Diablo had certainly heard about this fearless border agent and was determined to take revenge, but also use him as an example to his compatriots. Lenore Brockton had been contacted by the Border Patrol about the gunfight later that evening. The fact that Brett was not found meant that he had not been killed in the shooting. It was not certain that he was still alive, but she held out hope. When she picked up her mail after returning from work, she was sure the unstamped envelope addressed to Mrs. Brockton and marked urgent was from his captors. After reading the note, she was aware of the danger, but knew that she had to follow the directions explicitly if there was any hope of seeing her husband alive. The only question was how to raise the $10,000 quickly without drawing any attention to her. It was not that much money since she and her husband brought in more than that after taxes every month, but it was a week away from payday and they had only $4,200 in their checking account. She remembered the $20 gold coin that Brett had made into a necklace and given to her for, the, her tenth, for their 10th wedding anniversary that given the current price of gold, the coin alone should bring at least $6,000. She hated to part with it, but hopefully she would be able to redeem it after this was all over. She called her work number and left a message that she thought she had caught a stomach virus and would not be in. Before going to bed, she made her plan for the next day. Time would be crucial since she had a long drive to meet the kidnapper at 2 p.m. She checked for pawn shops close to their bank. Unfortunately, there were no pawn shops close to where they normally banked, but there was a branch only two blocks away from a number of pawn shops. First, she would need to get filled up at a nearby gas station, then to a pawn shop at 8 a.m. Even if they were busy, she should be able to complete her transaction in 45 minutes, then to the bank for the withdrawal by around 9, and out by maybe 9.20, and on her way out of Tucson by 9.30, which should give her plenty of time for unexpected contingencies. The next morning, bright and early, she was at one of the many Tucson pawn shops with an oversized purse just after it had opened for the day. She took the necklace out of, the, out of her purse and handed it to the clerk. He examined it, wrote a price on a slip of paper, and pushed it over the counter to her. When she saw the offer, she was so devastated and angry that she could barely register a response. You've got to be kidding or think I'm an idiot. Gold is over $6,500 an ounce. Okay, miss, I'll go $4,750, but not a cent more. All right, then, I'll take my business elsewhere. With that, she picked up her necklace, put it back in her purse, stormed out of the shop, and entered the shop two doors down. After having a similar experience at that shop and two or three more, her anger had mutated into a feeling of panic. She was fast running out of time. It was now 9.10, and she still had to go by the bank and then drive to the appointed rendezvous in Yuma 
242 miles away. She had figured that the trip on Interstate 8 would take about three and three quarter hours, allowing for a 15 minute rest stop. This was based on sticking to the speed limit since she didn't dare allow herself to be stopped for speeding which would screw up her timetable, not to mention the possibility the trooper might want to search her car after noticing that she was in a panic mode and find the $10,000 all in instructed $100 bills in her purse. All right. Um, unfortunately, um, our next presenter for the night, Angela Thomas, will not be able to attend. She unfortunately <clears throat> had, a, a, had an illness, so she wasn't able to make it. So we will be moving along to our next reader, Calvin Patrick. Calvin is from Hoover. He worked for AT&T for 23 years and was an officer with the Communication Workers of America, negotiating and administrating contracts in the nine southeastern states in the territory of Bell South. He retired in 1994 and now owns and manages property. Calvin has written and published Patrick Family History and a biography, Inside the Hurricane. Inside the Hurricane is based on his work experiences of negotiations, strikes, and the joy in reaching an agreement. This published work can also be found on Amazon.com. His reading this evening is from his book, Inside the Hurricane, a section titled, If They Could Only Be There. If the member could only be there, on February the 4th, 1986, South Central Bell advised the communications workers that the company was going to downgrade the job of planner signer, cutting the wages in that job over $125 per week. They were also going to reduce the workforce by 242 employees. Many of the technicians in this title had worked most of their career to reach this pre pre prestigious and highest paying job within the crafts. The company, upon notifying the union of this change, was advised that the union would be challenging the company's downgrade. I received more letters and phone calls on this issue than on any other change ever made by the company. I requested that the company set up a visit for me to go into the works location to learn more about the job. When we arrived at the Birmingham location, Management answered our questions for over an hour. When we were ready to proceed into the work environment, I asked the manager to tell me the name of one of the CWA job stewards she had confidence in and that the employees also trusted. She gave me the name of a job steward named Wayne Gilmore. As I didn't know Wayne, I asked the manager to introduce him to me. Wayne talked very frankly about the job, its difficulties, and the training that went into it before a person could become proficient. It was explained to him how we would challenge the company's decision. I left my CWA business card with Wayne and asked him to call me if he had any questions. Later that afternoon, Wayne called and said that the planner signers were meeting after work to discuss the downgrade issue. I asked could I come by and maybe be of some help. He felt that was a good idea. For three hours that evening, questions were answered. The contract was explained. The employees were told how we would approach challenging the company's actions. From my observations, the manager had been right. Wayne was the leader. He was a very mild-mannered and understood the union's need and what we needed to challenge the company's decision. He agreed to lead the team that was being formed I had a comfortable feeling that while the employees were not happy, they understood the problem and were satisfied with the way that we were challenging the company. The next morning, the company gave the employees an overview of what was going to happen. 
Wayne asked, would employees with more than 15 years of service have their wages uh, cut? Either the manager did not understand what he said or he didn't understand it. But his perception was that the employees would not have their wages protected. In our meeting, I had assured him that his wages were protected. The following day, I called Wayne to get a report on how his group was coming with collecting the data that we needed to support our case. Wayne was very cold. He was very distant. He was not putting anything together. I asked why. He said that I had misled him about the wage protection. For 10 minutes, I attempted to explain that under no conditions could the company take away this contractual right. He finally, in desperation, said that the company paid his wages, and he believed them. By, by then, my frustration had turned to anger. I advised him that within an hour, he'd be hearing from the company. That day, I had been meeting along with other union and company representatives in Anniston, Alabama, in an ongoing joint company and union effort merging the South Central Bell and Southern Bell CWA contracts as a result of AT&T divestiture and the subsequent creation of Bell South. As I left my hotel room after talking to Wayne, my counterpart was South Central Bell, Henry Dawson fell in stride with me as we headed back to the workroom. I vented my frustration and anger with Dawson of how could the company create such an impossible misunderstanding? I asked Henry to get on the phone and get this mess straightened out. I know he could feel my pain knowing that it must be devastating when a steward rejects a man who is working his heart out for the members. An hour later, I called Wayne. He was okay and ready to do his job. He never apologized, but he now believed in his union. This was a lesson for me also. The company has surfaced over 10,000 employees in the last four years. 2,300 of them were on layoff. I had talked to hundreds about their rights under the agreement, working out many problems, but with Wayne, for the first time, I really understood his, the feelings of a man who had given over 30 years of his life to the company and the union and was now feeling that no one really cared about him or the other employees. He was as low emotionally as he could be, feeling desperate and helpless. If he only knew how my heart went out for him and the others, if he could only sit in the meetings with management and the union as we worked together trying to find solutions to complex problems that the contract does not cover, if he could only be there when the, in desperation we asked the company to just give us an answer on agreements and we'll arbitrate the case. If he could be with the union staff as we sit together and attempt to come up with solutions that will protect the rights of all our members when there is, has never been an answer to a problem of this magnitude. If he could only be there when we later call the company to offer a possible solution and be, believe, and be relieved that our honorable men such as Henry Dawson are also working on a plan based upon our previous conversations that we felt had been a failure. If he and our other members could only be there when we reach an agreement that both parties can live without giving our members and giving our members additional rights. But that's the life of a union representative. The member only knows when he or she is in trouble and feels that no one seems to care. When a solution is found, they say, that's why we pay our dues. But deep inside, the union representative knows he or she has helped a group of employees that could not individually help themselves. It's not a job, it's a labor of love. Our next presenter tonight is Pat Temple. Pat is a recent transplant to Hoover from Michigan, the Mitten State. 
<clears throat> she taught fourth and fifth grades in Aurora, a Chicago suburb, for many years. After retiring from teaching, she wrote for a local newspaper in the small town of Vicksburg, Michigan. She hasn't published much, but she has had a few short stories published in literary journals. So please welcome to the stage, Pat. The Butterfly. What the lawyers said when they called us, eager to make a million off the driver who hit our son, was poppycock. In the first place, it wasn't her fault. One minute, our willy was in his sandbox. The next, he was running for the street, and bam. Didn't you love him? They'd try to bait me. Of course I loved him. I still do with all my heart in spite of his peculiarities, which at the time we didn't even notice, since when is suing the measure of a mother's love? I have come to believe that his amazing transformation came about not because of the accident, but as a direct result of his eating my house plants, which he began to do as soon as he was old enough to crawl. House plants come from the tropical rainforest which everyone knows is full of witch doctors and potent magics. Our understanding of these forces is limited by science and Christianity, but I am certain that long after the plants are brought here, some retain residual potions in their nectar. When I told my husband the things I'm about to tell you, he insisted I made them up. He said I, I would have mentioned them before if they were true, but at the time they didn't seem significant. How many mothers do you know who watch their children for signs that they're about to become butterflies? I dare say not many. Our pediatrician said even he had never heard of it. For one thing, Willie had an unnatural fear of birds that at first drove him to my arms when one of them appeared outside our window. Once he realized he was safe behind the glass pane, though, he took to taunting them and sticking out his tongue. This ornithophobia reached its high point sometime near his third birthday. I remember him running in the yard and in the streamers and the balloons and calling out to his guests, beware the aura pendula, which I have since learned is a common tropical bird. His manner of play was different from the others. His room had a bedspread with red stripes on it, and when they were playing hide and seek, he would put on his red and white striped T-shirt and lie across it, thinking it made him invisible. Once he came home from preschool with two round paint stains on the seat of his pants. I accused him of being careless, but now I realize they must have been eye spots and he wanted the class bullies to think he was much larger than he was. When I think of how I scolded him, it fills me with remorse. He loved his green twill jacket, and at bath time when we made him take it off, he would laugh and say he was molting. When the paramedics removed it, it was his final molt. All radiant and yellow, he crawled to the nearest tree where he hung on its bark to pump up his wings. It was in the days that followed when I could barely remember even who I was that I found peace with the realization that Willie had metamorphosed. Immediately, I began to plant asters and verbena. I got into the habit of asking other butterflies to tell Willie I said hello. My husband insisted I had no way of knowing if they knew Willie. Of course not, I told him. I only say it just in case. One morning while we were eating breakfast on the deck, I called out to a fritillary and my husband went completely berserk. He rushed into the kitchen, grabbed the black flag from under the sink and ran toward the flowers. Look, Ruth, he cried, I'm killing the damned butterflies. Your son is dead, Ruth, he's dead and now I'm killing his friends. It was then that I stabbed him with the bagel knife. 
It's difficult to talk to the staff here. When I answer their questions, I realize how lopsided and inadequate language is. We lack important words. For instance, a child who has lost his parents is called an orphan, but there's no word for a childless mother. And there are way too many words for insane. How I ramble, look, a spider has built a web in my window and the straps across my chest prevent me from rising to smash him. Assassin, murderer, I shall push the buzzer beside my bed. And if an attendant doesn't come quickly, I shall scream and scream. It's always nice to see a bagel knife get some use. You know. um, our next reader is Aubrey Drexel. And um, I'd like to begin her introduction with a formal apology. <clears throat> the leaflets you hold in hand have an erroneous error concerning the spelling of her name. Following the R, there should be the letters IE and not EY. If you have a pen in hand, I encourage you to correct this mistake immediately. Aubrey, A-U-B-R-I-E, is from Eastern Virginia and went to Virginia Tech for undergraduate and graduate school. She majored in creative writing and pre-education, and because of our flash fiction night, she has just started to write again after many years. So please welcome her to the stage. Thank you, Anthony. The definition of dreams is a succession of images, thoughts, or emotions passing through the mind during sleep. My dreams are a ball of stress, confusion, and magic that can cause laughter and possibly pain to others and myself. I had a dream in college about zombies. It was one of my first dreams I recorded simply because it was so vivid. He was the first in my family to be bitten. Thankfully, he was 84. He had lived his life. Also, that meant he was a sitter sometimes a walker, but rarely. My mother put up baby gates around his recliner. He didn't care. He just sat and watched the Weather Channel or America's Funniest Home Videos, sometimes moaning about Tom Bergeroff's egotistical antics. It felt as though nothing had changed. My uncle and father were next, 61 and 57, both off at the gun range. They had their guns and ammo, but it wasn't enough. They made it home in time to say goodbye. My uncle chained himself to a tree and asked my Aunt Anne to shoot him. My mother chained my dad to his bedpost and his room. She kept the windows open. At the time, we thought it was smart. If others came, they might think he was a friend had been left for dead, and they would rescue him without searching the rest of the house. Actually, that's why we didn't shoot Grandpa. At this point, my Aunt Anne was now extremely suicidal had shot her own husband with his gun and assumed her son was some sort of dead. He had left his job in New Orleans when the news would broadcast. He told me he had gone mountain climbing to enjoy what life was left. He had always loved climbing. We were close. He would call me once a week, and in his final call, he had told me not to tell his mom his girlfriend had eaten his dog. I laughed. I asked him, what was it like to, eat, to watch her eat one of her own kind? He hung up and stopped calling. I had lost the ability to cry when my eldest sister, Marie, had been shot by her own husband. She was still human, 25. They had just given up. He had shot her and then committed suicide. The two people left in my family that actually believed in the promise of the rainbow. After that, crying was transformed into uncontrollable laughter. I laughed when my father told me he was bitten. I laughed when my mother killed my cat so we could have dinner. I laughed at my Aunt Anne when she cried about having to shoot her husband. And I laughed when my Aunt Alyssa with Down syndrome called me a weirdo. My Aunt Alyssa, my saving grace. She knew that things were wrong, but still somehow smiled. My mother spent all her time with her making sure Grandpa didn't bite her, making sure Aunt Anne didn't kill her or herself, leaving Alyssa alone with Grandpa. My other sister, Lynn, was next to go. Unfortunately, she was a runner. 
She wanted to see Dad, a mistake we've all been tempted to make. At 23, she was now a matter of dead, lurking around, shrieking, and moaning. My mother decided it was time. We leave in the morning. Before we left, I heard her whisper, Amen. I snorted, my mother, praying. She was the last person I would see praying to some deity who had left his creations to die. That rainbow, promising the flood would never come again, glistened through the kitchen stained glass window. Next was supposed to be the fire, burning in hell for all eternity. Why not pray? Morning came, and my mother quickly gathered Alyssa and her things in the car. I stand guarding our exit with my father's shotgun. My Aunt Anne would stay behind taking care of Grandpa and the grave she would soon take. Lynn, still somehow understanding everything, Lynn, my best friend, knowing that we would never see each other again, watched me. Her mouth moved slowly with only gurgled breaths escaping. I started to laugh, giggling, cackling. I shot her in the stomach. I shot her in the arm. She lunged. Don't leave me. I love you more than mom. Her fingernails clawed into my arm and her teeth sunk into my hip. We're all mad here, I screamed. I saw mom. She had seen everything and heard everything. She drove away. I blew a kiss and laughed. On a much lighter note, I had a dream about Lynn that didn't make me cry when I woke up. My favorite one being when we were roommates in college. When I was younger, one of the most popular book series, and still is, Harry Potter. Being someone who hated to read, I did not read the books until well after Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows was released. When I decided to read the main seven books, they caused some interesting dreams and interesting stories. The air was cold and dark clouds filled the sky around my apartment. Death Eaters appeared in black smoke. An apartment wall crashed open. Lynn and I ran through the gaping wall and found a fireplace. We were in desperate need of flu powder. We need flu powder, I mumbled. What? Lynn was awake doing homework. She talked back to me, a sleeping person. Flu powder. What? Lynn tried to understand why me, a sleeping person, would need flu powder. Flu powder. What? Oh my god, I'm going to punch you. We need flu powder. Insert explicative here that rhymes with male deer, ing, flu powder. We find the flu powder, but end up separated. Later in the dream, however, I find Lynn. I forgive her for not understanding that we desperately needed flu powder for this reason. Lynn, I have some bad news and good news. The bad news is the Dark Lord is back. The good news is he has friendship bracelets. Our next performer tonight is Sue Lawrence. Sue writes nonfiction for children and adults, and she's a storyteller for ARC Stories at the Avon Theater here in Birmingham. ARC Stories are true, personal stories told before a live audience. Their podcasts are on iTunes and on their website at www.arcstories.com. Tonight, Sue is reading her holiday-themed creative nonfiction piece about a treasured family tradition. So please welcome to the stage, Sue. When a half is as good as a whole. When it comes to birthdays, my older brother Paul insists that he has celebrated more of them than anyone else in America, maybe even the world. Paul has had approximately 123 birthday celebrations in his honor. So I guess his outlandish claim is technically the truth and would put him in some Guinness Book of World Records if there was such a category. While Christmas, with its paper snowflake cutouts, a decades-old nativity set complete with a broken camel's neck, the pungent molasses scent of German Lepkuchen cookies, and my two older brothers' three-day-long Monopoly games stands out as my favorite holiday memory. It's my brother Paul's half-birthday that was our family's most original tradition. His half-birthday celebration occurred the day after Christmas every year, started by our mom in the late 1950s when Paul was either eight or nine years old and we were living in a farm 
on a farm in Odenville, Alabama. That year on Christmas Day, he had lamented, it's just not fair, Mom. I think we ought to celebrate my birthday tomorrow because it's exactly six months till my real one in June, and that's way too long to have to wait. Mom replied, why, I think that's an excellent idea, Polly. Thus began a new holiday tradition with a sheet cake made from scratch, cut in half with one side topped by the other to make an almost square two-layer cake, accompanied by vanilla ice cream, hand-cranked in a speckled blue-green ice cream churn. My brothers Paul and Jonathan and our dad all took turns filling the ice cream maker with rock salt and ice cubes, each turning the crank as fast as they could until their right arm went numb, passing the chore on to the next one in line. My sister Lydia and our cousin Sharon helped Mom mix the cake batter. Then they frosted and decorated the baked cake by themselves, while my brother Sammy slouched with sleepy eyes in his wheelchair next to the big wooden farm table with the chipped white paint. I was later born into this half-birthday tradition and became the official frosting taster of the family. Paul's half-birthday was a special routine that tapered the excitement of Christmas more gently for all the kids, but Paul was the only one who recognized it as truly his particular day. None of us other kids ever asked for or needed a half-day celebration. It just wasn't that important to us like it was to Paul, the oldest and most depended on of all the children. Celebrations came often in our family, but they were unpretentious affairs. A home-cooked meal served on a red and white checkered tablecloth was the norm, a welcome respite from the stressors of a financially strapped household. Birthday gifts were simple and cost-efficient. Handmade cards made from scraps of construction paper and crayon nubs. A pint-sized carton of Barber's chocolate milk. A small dented ball or a set of jacks. Wrapping paper was the previous week's Sunday comics. A splash of color with no bow required. Singing hymns and children's songs accompanying most festivities, even if simple ice water popsicles in the summertime were the only dessert served. But the day after Christmas was Paul's day, and his half-birthday continued until he was a senior in college and 21 years of age, when our mom died unexpectedly at the age of 49. Life changed for all of us after that day. We survived and we thrived. We succeeded and we greeted each day as a blessing. But the holidays changed after mom was gone. She was the glue that held our family together through tough times and she had a knack for making adventures out of mundane days. Paul later married and had two daughters of his own, and his new family resumed his half-birthday tradition at his request. One year, his wife Connie served him half a cup of coffee in a mug shaped like a cup cut right down the middle, half a piece of cake, and she gave him half a birthday card with a gift on his half-birthday. That did not go over well. Paul expected the whole shebang. A real birthday celebration with no shortcuts allowed. The humor of the half-sized coffee cup and the half a piece of cake did not resonate with Paul that year, which was uncharacteristic of him. Connie was perplexed until finally he explained. Paul shared how our mother had made him feel valued and singled out on that day by establishing a family tradition for his benefit alone. Paul had made... Mom had made Paul feel like his half-birthday was as good as a whole, a memorable connection between a mother and her firstborn child. Paul's half-birthday celebrations continue to this day, touching reminders of days gone by. Although one can't help but wonder if my brother has an ulterior motive in all this. After all, it is a way for him to get more presents the day after Christmas, and birthday cake and ice cream too. You know, I may have just figured out one reason why my big brother was given the nickname Fox back in college. Yeah, he's pretty sly, all right. Hmm. Thank you. Our next reader's uh, name is Ezekiel Adams. 
Ezekiel began writing at a young age. His most recent short story, Shadows Among Us, was published in Chronicles of Shadow People and at shadowpeople.org. The excerpt he will be reading for us tonight is from his fourth book in his Wonderland series. The other three have yet to be written because only a sane person would start at the beginning. Now, without any further ado, let's take a trip down the rabbit hole and return to madness. <clears throat> it's been seven months since Alice Carroll left Wonderland in search of her parents on the Queen's Island prison known as Neverland. In her absence, a new evil has arisen from the fallen kingdom of hearts. Wonderland's once majestic land now lies in ruin, with most of its citizens either imprisoned, hiding, or worse. The one exception to this is Derby Caps, known to most as the Mad Hatter. He is blissfully unaware of the surrounding dangers. He sits at home in his favorite antique umbrella chair that once belonged to his great-great-grandfather, twice removed but put back in. He had fallen asleep in front of the warm fire of the fireplace, now nothing more than glowing embers. He was pulled out of his slumber when the teapot next to him, made of royal duton with hand-painted periwinkles, began to chime. He reached for the lid of the pot and pulled out a pocket watch. Oh, look at that, he said as he held it up to his face. It's tea time. As he stood, he placed the watch in the pocket of his waistcoat, then crossed over to the hat rack next to the front door. Why do I own so many hats but only one head, he said to himself. I should look into getting another one. They do say two heads are better than one. <clears throat> but until then, which one should I wear for tea? The red one? No. Reminds me too much of the queen. Black? No. Black is for morning. Although I don't know why. Mornings are bright, not black. Green? Green is a happy color. Yes, green it is. He picked up the top hat, threw it into the air, and it landed neatly on his head. After he checked himself in the nearby mirror, he stepped outside. The trees that surround his weirdly misshapen home were now barren. Their branches twisted downward like hands ready to snatch up any who crossed their path. Before him, off in the distance, stood three marble columns. <clears throat> Seven, six months ago, there would have been six with a vine of mushrooms that snaked their way up to the roof. At night, the mushrooms would glow, lighting up the area with a calming blue color. Derby had planted those mushrooms with his mother when he was just a small child. They're gone now, destroyed like most of Wonderland by the knave of hearts, who seeks revenge on behalf of his dead queen. But he has not been acting alone. He forged an unholy alliance with a mysterious wicked woman from a neighboring land in the West, <clears throat> from a neighboring land in the West. Undeterred by any of this, the Hatter goes about his daily routine. He walked up a set of stairs built into the earth that led to the pavilion, then took his place at the head of the table. Once seated, he poured himself a cup of apple lemon butterscotch tea. He brought the cup up to his nose to savor the sweet aroma he was just about to take a sip when a door fell from the sky, landing upright just a few feet from his table. He sat there frozen as the brass knob began to turn. You're squeezing too hard, the doorknob cried out. I'm sorry, a woman apologized on the other side. The door opened outward with a heavy moan. Standing in the doorway was Alice. Derby closed his eyes. Go away, you hallucination. I am not in the mood. You fooled me too many times, but not today. He sipped his strange, he said as he sipped his strange concoction of tea. Hatter, what's wrong, she asked, taking a step forward after closing the door. I tried to get back sooner, but the way back was locked. A worried look crossed her face as she looked around her new surroundings. What happened here? Derby's eyes grew wide with shock. The teacup slipped from his fingers, spilling its contents over the table. Hallucinations don't talk, he said. That must mean it's really you. Hatter jumped to his feet with such excitement that his chair fell backwards. He ran around, scooped her up into his arms. Welcome back, he shouted for all to hear. Alice smiled as he twirled her around. 
He could not remember the last time he felt this happy. He put her down, then draped his arm over her shoulders to escort her to the table. Come, join me. You're just in time for tea. Pull up an armchair, he said as he held it out for her. I would get you a leg chair, but they've all run away. Hatter, it's good to see you, but you didn't answer my question. He ignored her and collected his chair from where it had fallen. So, tell me, Alice, he said as he sat down, why the long time no see? His mind began fixated on that last word, sea. Sea? <gasps> you know, I'm glad we're not near the sea. I can't swim. Well, I can swim, as good as any rock. But then again, I know some rocks who are some very good swimmers. Hatter, concentrate. What happened to Wonderland? Look at this mess, he remarked as he wiped up the spilled tea. Some people do not know how to act at a tea party. I would never make a mess like this. Hatter? Listen to me. She placed her hand on his arm. What happened here? His head popped up so quick that his hat wobbled. His eyes grew big. Alice, when did you get here? Have you ever noticed that here and there are the same place? Think about it. We are here, but if we go over there, then there becomes here. Ugh. Why must you be so difficult to talk to? Why? Why? Why is the question most people ask but seldom get the answer to? Why is because, and because is why. Because of you, Wonderland is changing. Me? What did I do? She asked, getting offended. You killed the Queen of Hearts. Or was it the Red Queen? Ugh, what difference does it make? Both are evil and wanted to cut off heads. Ooh, now that I think about it, I wonder if they're the reason the Headless Horseman is headless. Had her, Alice shouted as she banged her palm against the table, causing the tea set to rattle. Stay on topic. <clears throat> yes, sorry. Staying on topic, he replied, shaking his head to shake out the nonsense that was slowly taking over his mind. Staying on topic, he paused to collect his thoughts. <clears throat> when you killed the Queen of Hearts, someone else took over. Who? I'm getting to that, you know. I'd get there a lot faster if you'd stop interrupting. You know, you are very difficult to talk to. Before Alice could respond, a sinister cackle filled the air from above. They craned their necks to see a shadowy figure cloaked in black, riding to what looked to be a broom streak across the sky. There's no time! The hatter's voice trembled with urgency. He jumped up, yanked Alice to her feet. You must go! Follow the blue brick road. Not the yellow one. I don't know where that one came from. It'll take you, the blue road will take you to the queen's old hedge maze. In the center, you will find a gazebo. It'll transport you to the temple of the Cheshire cat. Or is it sudden death? No, no, I'm sure it's the cat. The maze has four entrances. Diamonds, hearts, clubs, and spades. Follow the spades. And remember, spay and neuter your pets. An unwanted pet is like a radish. A confused look crossed Alice's face. Don't look at me like that. It makes perfectly good sense inside my head. It's not my fault you don't understand. <sighs> it's not my fault you don't understand. Before she could respond, the figure in black returned, but this time soldiers marched over the hill. Run, the hatches screamed. Now that I understand, Alice replied. She ran down the path into the barren forest, disappearing within the safety of its shadows. Thank you. And now last, but certainly never least, is Carol Wilde. Carol is from the Ham, but lived in North Carolina for 10 years. She loved North Carolina and thinks of it as God's country. If only God would not put coleslaw and barbecue sandwiches served in this country, then North Carolina would rate a perfect 10. Carol's favorite expression? The pen is mightier than the sword. Please welcome Carol. Good evening. Top three must avoid at your next winning lottery number party. We're all familiar with the expression, it's a red flag. It denotes using caution, be on guard for something that's not quite as it seems. What color, though, is the opposite? The color that says, throw caution to the wind, be willing to take a risk, 
Jump up and down on your mother's favorite sofa and forget to take your sneakers off too. Let's call the color of this flag green, a color you would want to wave across our great country once you possess the winning Powerball lottery numbers. There are those who disapprove of playing the lottery for a variety of reasons, and I do respect that. If that is your persuasion, just hand over that winning ticket and I'll relieve you of that stressful burden. That being said, I am pre-planning my winning lottery number celebration. I want green flags waving all over my palatial new home as my friends jump it up and down on any sofa they like. But there are pitfalls. Every invitee list is simultaneously a non-invitee list. Here are my top three of non-invitees. Of course, your list when you win Powerball, it will probably differ. Please just utilize my list as a guide only. Here we go. Top three persons who are not invited to my winning lottery number celebration. Number three, Coach Nick Saban. Please set aside your rakes and your pitchforks. It's not a decision based on football or anything personal about the man. I know what type of party guest Coach Saban would be in this situation. He would not congratulate me until he asked which charity would benefit from my newfound riches. I would say, uh, save the whales. The coach would ask me to text him the radio frequency of, my, of the whales and which ocean that they called home. The next morning after my party, there would be a crisp knock at my front door, about 5 a.m. I would open my door to find the University of Alabama coach clean and dressed sharply in a workout suit complete with whistle chains around his neck. This man, I would swear, has never caressed the smoothness of a good old snooze button. He would tell me that one of my whales had gone belly up over the night. One of the uh, trainers he had sent to check on this said, no, it wasn't fake news, it was real news. Either this whale that I had not saved had died of old age or, or bad sushi. It was my fault. I would apologize, but for penance, I would need to follow Coach Saban back to Tuscaloosa immediately. There I would be told to hop, skip, and probably comasize my brain through several islands of tires, lots and lots of tires. The, par uh, the paramedics would be standing around to rush me to the nearest Tuscaloosa ho hospital. More than likely, uh, after tire island number three, Coach Saban is a realist. I do like that about him, as I am whirled away by the grand machine with the blaring horns and flashing red lights. College football's greatest coach would lean down and apologize to the stretcher-clad me. Forget it, Coach Saban, I would answer. I had a whale of a time with you. Nick Saban, not invited, too much of a perfectionist, sorry. Number two on my list, this person in particular, their job is the source of many sleepless nights for me and millions the world over. The anxiety provoked of what they do for each TV show episode is unbearable. Thus, this person is not invited to my lottery party. I am speaking, of course, of the screenwriter who selects the addresses of the hit TV show Law and Order. Absolutely nothing good happens to anyone whose address flashes upon the TV screen when this show airs. And as long as this show has graced the airways, spinoffs included, thousands of addresses have been selected by the Law and Order screenwriter staff. New York City's a large apple, but I wring my hands often wondering or if my address will be, ever be shown. These kiss of death address people have got to be close to the end of Manhattan's yellow pages. If I win Powerball, I would love to rent an apartment by Central Park. If this screenwriter attends my lottery party, I am afraid I have no doubt that my address will be shining brightly on my screen the very next week. Oh, sure, he, will, he or she will change the numbers like 123 Cherry Street would be 312 Cherry Street. But my address would be the inspiration for people being tossed out of my window like popcorn in the movie theater lobby. By droves, just after I had my custom-made window treatments installed for each and every window. Spending a fortune on now-wrinkled curtains sporting yellow crime scene tape. Oh, uh, no, not me. 
Screenwriter, address, selector on law and order, you are not invited to my lottery party. And last but not least, on the tip of your tongue, yes, it's them. Don't get me wrong, I love z the zoo. I am an animal lover. I also love newly furbished bathrooms that smell of lilac, a huge tub that glistens sparkling clean and white. But top of my list of do not invites is the charming bear family. That's several hundred pounds of bear there, all taking their own toilet tissue to my party. That's not a green flag, that's a red flag. Charming bears, please take your toilet tissue and head to your local bear GI doctor in the woods. You are not welcome at my winning lottery number celebration. By the way, all of you are welcome to my party and don't worry, I'll supply the Charming. I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. And once again, let's have a final round of applause for everybody who read tonight.